Welcome to Secrets Unsealed. This is their annual conference. We're in the beautiful area of California and Yosemite, and it is beautiful here. I wish everyone, and I hope everyone, heard Pastor Boer's um, talk last night. It was just wonderful. Every time I hear him talk about Daniel and Revelation, I learn something new. And I uh, just appreciate him so much and appreciate the ministry of Secrets Unsealed. This morning, we're going to be talking about something that's very important, I believe, as we're approaching the end of time. We're standing on the verge of eternity. We're standing on the verge of probably the greatest crisis, the greatest crisis the world has ever seen. We call it the time of trouble, the close of human probation. Many people are confused. There are so many false gospels everywhere, and we need the good, solid teaching of the Word of God. And so we're going to take our Bibles this morning, and we're going to talk about the temptations of Jesus. Why are we going to do that? It's because in every human heart, in every human mind, what Jesus went through will go on in our own minds, in our own hearts. Believe me, I have experienced it, I do experience it, and I am grateful for this mighty Jesus that we have. So as we stand on the verge of a stupendous crisis, when temptation is going to be overwhelming, Jesus said temptation would be so bad in the end of time that if it were possible, and hallelujah that it's not, we could deceive the very elect. Everybody's experienced temptation. Uh, somebody said one time that temptation was the only thing they couldn't resist. <laughs> I'm not trying to be funny, but a lot of human beings live their life that way. Unfortunately, a lot of Adventists live their lives that way. A lot of Christians live their life that way. There's a lot of false gospel that just simply says, don't worry about anything. Uh, Jesus has done it all, and it is true, Jesus has done it all. But a lot of people don't let that done at all apply to their own life and their own living. Jesus didn't go to Calvary's cross to indulge us in continued sinful behavior. He went to Calvary's cross to deliver us from sinful behavior. That's why we're going to a heaven that's holy and sinless. Now, use that word sinless and people start getting nervous. I don't have time to get into all of that except to say one thing, that the gospel of the Lord Jesus and the grace of God is given to us to help us to be overcomers. It's the book of Revelation at the end of all seven of those churches that pronounces a blessing and a promise to overcomers. Some people don't like to talk about victory, but the Bible talks about victory. And the book of Revelation says they got victory over the beast and his image, over the temptation. You don't think the mark of the beast is going to be a temptation? It's going to be a huge temptation. So if you have your Bibles this morning, I'd like for you to turn and want to look at the setting just a little bit. In Matthew chapter 3, Matthew chapter 3, and we don't understand the temptations of Jesus until, first of all, we look at the setting in which it happened. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 13, then Jesus came from Galilee. Thirty years Jesus had been in obscurity. We don't see very much about his life. We see that flash when he's 12 years old as he goes uh, to the Passover. He stays. His parents are worried about them. They come back. They finally find him basically teaching the teachers of his day at 12 years old. They were they were fascinated with this young man. They loved to get their hands on him, but God wasn't going to let them get their hands on him because God was going to school him himself. And then, and then we find him talking to his parents, and they, they're saying, well, wh where have you been? Why did you do this? And then he says those insightful words at 12 years old. He says, I must be about my father's business. He had already understood our special relation between him and his father, and his mind was focused on doing the will of his father and his life being guided by his father at 12 years old. And the Bible simply says that he grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. But 
Then we have the word then. Then introduces us when Jesus steps out of that obscurity and steps into his public ministry, that public ministry that has affected and changed the world and changed our lives. Then, verse 13, chapter 3, the book of Matthew, then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John who? John the Baptist. John the Baptist also appears on the scene of Israel's history, and it's dramatic, it's powerful. He comes out of nowhere and he begins to preach. He wears kind of rough garments, he eats simple diet. But he preaches with power and the Holy Spirit is present and the whole nation is awakened. The leaders of Israel are so amazed by this man, they show up and they want to know about him. And he has a, he has a startling message. You have to understand in the conscience of Israel, the conscience of Israel, the one thing that they had looked forward to, the one thing the prophecies had pointed forward to was the coming of the Messiah. The Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ, as he's called in the Greek, the Christos. That was the hope of Israel. And we might add the hope of the world. For it was not just given to Israel, that promise. It was given at the fall of man. We're going to go back and look at the fall of man in a little bit. But here John the Baptist steps out with this startling, powerful message. And it was simply this. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and the Messiah is already among you. Now that took everybody by surprise. They'd waited hundreds of years, and now to have this powerful prophetic voice saying, you don't know him, but he's among you. He's here. Listen, listen to the scripture as Jesus comes to John in verse 14. And to be baptized by John, Jesus comes to Jordan to be baptized by John. Verse 14, and John tried to prevent him. Why does John try to prevent him? When he sees Jesus, the Holy Spirit is present. And when he sees Jesus, the testimony of, of John is... I, I shouldn't baptize you. You need to baptize me. Why? Because when he looks at the Savior and under the witness of the Holy Spirit, he sees the perfect man. He sees a man who is holy. By the way, the word holy and perfection go together. He sees this man who is, has an atmosphere of holy, whose whole life is a life of purity. There is not one selfish attitude in Christ. None. Selfishness that pollutes the human heart. And there was no pollution in the affections of Jesus. Jesus answers John with a very fascinating answer. He says, permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. In other words, it's true, I don't need to be baptized. Jesus didn't argue with John, but he says, let it happen anyway, because the baptism of Jesus pointed forward to a reality, a reality of a baptism of death. And the reality of a resurrection of life. And in that death and resurrection, the whole human race would have a marvelous opportunity. Because, you see, we needed another Adam. Our first Adam failed us miserably. But I want to come back. To John for just a moment here to get a bigger picture of this. If you just go with me, leave your finger there because we'll keep coming back to Matthew. But if you'd like to go with me over to John chapter 1, the Gospel of John chapter 1, and I want to look at a few, a few um, verses here about John the Baptist. Uh, because John the, God, uh, John the Apostle brings this into focus. Verse 19, the voice in the wilderness. Verse 19, John chapter 
1. Now this is the testimony of John. So the Apostle John says that John the Baptist has a testimony about Jesus. And so he puts a lot of stock in John the Baptist's testimony that Jesus is indeed the anointed one. The testimony of John, when the Jews sent priests to the Levites and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, John the Baptist, who are you, John the Baptist? Who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed and said, I am not the Christ. So John the Baptist made it clear, I am not that anointed one. Yes, I may be preaching with power. Yes, I am baptizing. Yes, there's a great revival and reformation, but I am not that Messiah. And then they ask him, who are you, Elijah, et cetera, et cetera. Verse 22, they said to him, who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? And this is his response. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. In other words, get ready because the Messiah is here. The kingdom of heaven is it here. Now I say this with humility and I say it with kindness. No matter what kind of difficulties and trials God's end time church may go through, it is to become the voice of John the Baptist in the end of time, telling the world, make straight the way of the Lord. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And when you use that word repent, that word repent means a 180 degree change. This is not, this is not fuzzy. This is not taking time to be nice. We should always be kind. This is straight and direct. You don't play around with repentance. You don't have a dozen different choices. You have two. You either repent or you don't. It's a stark reality. If we're going to be ready for Jesus to come, anybody that's going to be ready for Jesus to come must repent. Not of some of their sins, not of part of their sins, but of all of their sins. Verse 29. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him. And what does he do? He says, behold, look. The Lamb of God. The, the insight that I had that Ellen White gives us in the book Desire of Ages, that not even John understood the import of that, but under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, when he sees Jesus, he says, Look, behold, the Lamb of God. He says it not only once, but when he sees Jesus the next day, he says it again. Behold, the Lamb of God. Because the Holy Spirit had witnessed to him. Coming back to Matthew, Matthew chapter 3. When Jesus was baptized, some wonderful things happened. Verse 16. Jesus came up, chapter 3, verse 16, the book of Matthew. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. That declaration was a message to the world. The baptism of Jesus was the anointing of his mission, the anointing of his ministry. This was the start in three and a half years. Jesus would change the world. Now you can go to all the great religions of the world. You can look at Buddhism. They, they hung around for decades. You can look at Hinduism, all of this kind of stuff. There's nothing like, the, like Jesus. He's the incomparable Jesus. There's no one that you can compare him to. In a mere three and a half years, 
His entire ministry changes our world. And yet he never held any kind of office. He's changed my life. He's changed your life. So we have this marvelous scene that announces the ministry of Jesus. We have the dove, the Holy Spirit. We have the voice, his heavenly father. And we have the message. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now, in chapter 4, immediately after that marvelous voice from heaven, the heavenly father declaring this as his son, the Bible uses the word then. The apostle Peter uses the word um, uh, in the book of Mark, or Mark uses the word. We think Mark was Peter's gospel written by Mark. He uses the word immediately, then in other words, there is a change. What happens next is that the Spirit of God, the dove, takes charge of the ministry of Jesus. And the Bible is very clear about what happened here. It says, then Jesus was led by the Spirit. The book of Mark says he was driven there by the Spirit of God. In other words, this isn't, Jesus has surrendered his will to his Father. And the Father, in essence, has given orders to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit now takes Jesus under his wing. And the next move of the Holy Spirit is to take Jesus into the wilderness. Now, that's not the first place you'd want to go. I kind of thought about that driving up here. We're all glad that, you know, we've got a room and we've got hot water and heat and air conditioning. But if you go out there, you don't have that. Am I right? Yosemite is a beautiful wilderness. But this was a desert wilderness that Jesus was going into. Sometimes the Holy Spirit takes, if you surrender your life to Christ, that's easier said than done. The Spirit of God will direct your life. And sometimes He will lead us into a wilderness. He led Jesus in that wilderness for a specific purpose. And that was for prayer and fasting and to be tested. Three things. Prayer and fasting to prepare him for three and a half years of some of the most, of the most intense conflict any human being has ever entered into, which would end with his death of, by crucifixion and ultimate victory by his resurrection. And the whole destiny of the human race depended on that three and a half years. And Jesus went into that wilderness to fast and pray. Don't raise your hand. Why do we fast and pray? Do you fast and pray? I'll be honest. I don't like fasting. I don't like going hungry. But there's power in fasting. There's not merit in fasting. But there is power in fasting. Because in this great unseen conflict that's also seen in the human race between Christ and Satan, when we fast and pray, Jesus uses that against the forces of darkness. And he says to them, he says to them, look, I'm going to answer the prayers of this person because this person is very sincere. Even Jesus himself said one time about certain demons. He says, these don't come out except by fasting and prayer. Why? Because it is our fasting and prayer that gives Jesus the power, not the power, but the permission. He has the power, the permission to move against the forces of darkness.
Then Jesus, verse 4, chapter 4, verse 1, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. This word tempted, I, I was looking it up, and it's, uh, it can mean either way. It can either mean tempted or tested. Now, the Bible says in, John, in James that God tempts no one. It's the same word. But the context determines its use and its application. The English actually helps us out here because we have two words. We have a word called tempted and another word called tested. There's a difference between being tempted and being tested. And sometimes they come together. That doesn't mean that there's not a trial in a sense. Um, if somebody comes to you to tempt you in the English, that's because they have a bad plan for you. Am I right? In the book of Revelation, chapter 18, there's a beautiful woman. She's very attractive. The whole world is charmed by her. And she tempts the whole world, and they take the bait. But what's the end of it? pretty terrible when you were tested in school by your teacher what did your teacher want you to do do they want you to fail or pass they want you to pass every teacher that's a good teacher wants her his or her students to pass the test right God also tests us. He tests us because, as the Bible says in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 8, that God tested Israel to see what was in their heart. He tests us because he gave us freedom of will. We are not robots. We are his children. And the testing goes on to check and see what's in our heart. The devil doesn't test anybody. The devil tempts in order to destroy. But the Lord allows sometimes his test, he allows the devil to show up. So Jesus led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted, tested by the devil. Now who is this devil? How does he show up? How does he get here the devil well I'm going to if you don't mind I'm going to use the book Desire of Ages for our listening audience if you're not familiar with the Desire of Ages it's the best book in the world on the life of Christ mine, I know mine looks pretty ragged but it's my favorite book outside the Bible and uh I love the great controversy, and the book Great Controversy should be spread everywhere. But once people have been shocked with the truth about what's going to happen in this world, they need the living Christ, and that's found here in the Desire of Ages. And um, in the Desire of Ages, we have a statement here. It's under the, the temptations of Christ that I want just to share with you um, very quickly. Um, it's on page 49. And, and this is, unto you a Savior is born. It's one of the most, I, I've got it underlined and then I've got it highlighted because I want us to understand. It's just, I can't do it better. So I'm going to read it. Is that okay? <laughs> Satan in heaven hated Christ for his position in the courts of God. Now, what, let, me just, let me just fill that out for just a, a moment. Why did he hate Jesus? How, how could that be? This is a holy heaven. There's no devil in heaven. There's no selfish world in heaven. Everything in heaven is a place of unselfish love. So how in the world could this guy hate Jesus? One person calls it, G. Campbell Morgan calls it, the temptation from within. How, wh where do you get a temptation from within? It's because 
We are free moral agents. When God created us as his children, then he took a risk. And the risk is that if he gives you the power of choice, that you can choose the wrong thing. Satan, Lucifer, the light bearer, had the power of choice. And he, he looked at Jesus. Now, I think if I've understood this right and if I've sorted it out right, and I think I have, that Jesus there was in the form, if you please, of an angelic being, a cherub. The book of Revelation says that Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. The Bible speaks of Lucifer being a covering cherub. Anybody who knows anything about the sanctuary that was given to Israel knows that over the mercy seat, there's not only the Ark of the Covenant with the Ten Commandments, but above it is a mercy seat. Hallelujah for the mercy seat. And over that mercy seat were two angels. They called them covering cherubs. I believe that Christ, not a created being, he is God, he always has been, he always will be. He's the self-eternal one, if you please. But in the form of that angelic being was one of those covering cherubs and the other one was that highest mastermind of God's creation, a perfection of God's creation. There's no mind like him. As one says, as I read in one place, that he was actually like a mirror reflection, if you please, of God himself. And he, he's the other covering cherub. But he was not self-existent. He was created. And he was not invited into the councils of the Trinity, of the Godhead. Jesus was. Because he was one with them. And somehow, over time, Lucifer desire to have what Jesus had instead of being satisfied with what God had given him instead of being satisfied with the great privileges that God had given him he began to desire something that did not and could not ever belong to him does that sound like the world we live in today We need to accept what God has given us and praise God for it. Accept the roles that God has given us and not be restless. But little by little, by his own choices, Lucifer began to change that heart of unselfish love and began to change it by his own choices into something else. Listen, God who gets blamed for all of this mess. Our Heavenly Father, whose name has been assaulted and uh, uh, blasphemed all over everywhere, our Heavenly Father is not the prime mover of evil. The prime mover of evil is Lucifer. And as we have said in other times, God never made a devil but Lucifer made a devil out of himself. And let me add this. There is no excuse. None. There's no reason why he should have done it. But he had the freedom of choice. And he, God took the risk. So this devil shows up. Now, I'm going to go back to my little book, Desire of Ages, Satan in heaven hated Christ for his position in the courts of God. He hated him more when he, Lucifer himself, was dethroned. He hated him who pledged himself to redeem a race of sinners, of which I'm part. Yet into the world where Satan claimed dominion, 
Notice she didn't say he had dominion, but that he claimed dominion. More about that later. God permitted, I think it was a struggle for God the Father to send his only begotten son into this world. We just don't understand what a wonderful, heavenly, unselfish, heavenly father we have. A helpless babe, subject to the weaknesses of humanity, he permitted him to meet life's peril in common with every human soul. To fight the battle as every child of humanity must fight it at risk of failure and eternal loss. My kids are grown. I used to read this next paragraph, and when I became a father, I understood it better. The heart of a human father yearns over his son. He looks into the face of his little child and trembles at the thought of life's peril. He longs to shield his dear one from Satan's power, hold him back from temptation and conflict. Have you ever felt that way about your children? Felt that way about your grandchildren? Felt that way about the little kids that maybe not in your direct family, in your church? Walk into our schools and I think, see those precious little kids in first grade? To meet a bitterer conflict and a more fearful risk. God gave His only begotten Son that the path of life might be made sure for our little ones. Herein is love. Wonder, O heavens, and be astonished, O earth. Verse 3, chapter 4. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God. Well, let me go back. Just, I should have got the first two first. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry. I've never come even close to fasting But how many of you don't have to raise your hand? I know the answer. I just want to jog your memory. How many of you ever found yourself famished? In fact, you were so hungry it didn't really matter what it was so much. It's just, you know, when you get hungry, taste doesn't become so important. Am I right? You just get hungry. You know? You, you get on sometimes these long flights and all they give you is peanuts. <laughs> and you get there and you know you've been running around you hadn't got anything to eat. All of a sudden you're just hungry. This is far, far greater than anything like that. Forty days. Forty days, Jesus fasting and praying. Forty days, he's in communion with his heavenly Father. Forty days, he's thinking about his duties, his ministry, and where he's going to go. And at the end of 40 days, it suggests that Jesus now is left alone. That the communion has stopped that the special presence moves away. He's at the end of 40. By the way, the word, the number 40 is a time of testing. 40 days is done, and suddenly Jesus, out of that communion, realizes, understands, feels hunger. Why did the Spirit of God lead Jesus in there? Yes, he led him for communion, as we've already said, but also to be tested. One author says that 
that it was like Jesus, or I would maybe put the Holy Spirit in there, actually drugged the devil out of his, wherever he was, and forced him into conflict. But the devil can add and subtract. He has spent his whole life, the whole life of Jesus, 30 years watching Jesus, trying to bring him down. And he's looking for the most opportune time. His whole being centered on one thing. He wants to bring Jesus down. He's going to watch for the best opportunity. He knows he has an avenue of attack, like he had an avenue of attack with Adam and Eve. And as he watches this whole process He sees how hungry Jesus is. He sees how weak Jesus is. Jesus is emancipated. Um, His physical being has been changed by this fasting. He's lost weight. He's not strong. Jesus is very weak. The devil adds and adds correctly that the best time to attack Christ is now. And he moves. And his line of attack is the same line of attack that he used in the Garden of Eden. He moves on Jesus' physical need. By the way, is there anything wrong with hunger? Is hunger sin? God created it. There's nothing wrong with hunger. But Lucifer's purpose was to get Jesus to satisfy his hunger, a legitimate need, in an illegitimate way. So the avenue of attack is on the hunger. But what is it that Lucifer wants? What is it that Satan wants? He wants that fortress in Jesus' mind. A fortress that is loyal to God. And he wants to switch the loyalty from God to himself. That loyalty, that fortress is held by Jesus' faith and trust in his heavenly Father. So whatever the devil does, he has to get Jesus to give up his trust, his faith in his heavenly Father. He has to undermine that faith. Now, I want to uh, flash back to the Garden of Eden. If I don't get done with all this, we'll catch it up in the next time, okay? I want to flash back to the Garden of Eden for a minute. When Satan first moved on the human race, he caught Eve alone. And I, we could talk about that, but he catches Eve alone at the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The tree of knowledge of good and evil was a test, not a temptation. God put it there so they could grow in character. As they demonstrated their loyalty to God, as they demonstrated their faith in God and trust in God, God did not give them all the reasons. I want to just say this, really. You cannot always know all the reasons of why you, the troubles and difficulties and challenges that you have in life. But you must trust your heavenly Father. And that's where the rubber meets the road. And so Eve finds herself, perhaps with curiosity, in front of that tree of knowledge of good and evil. And it's the only place that Satan can get to her. And if you, if you got your fingers, flip back there. I want to show you something here that often, in fact, uh, Pastor Bohr talked about it last night in his sermon, and I, it was wonderful. Uh, chapter 3 of the book of Genesis, and um, he starts the conversation 
with a question because he wants to draw Eve into a conversation. By the way, you don't want to dilly-dally with the devil. You cannot out-argue him. And you're not clever enough to outsmart him. Ask some Adventist history. Ask Moses Hull, who went and debated with a spiritist. And he was told, don't do it. He had the truth on his side, but he wasn't able to deal with that kind of sophistry. Eve is there in the last part of verse 1 of chapter 3 of the book of Genesis. And he, Satan, said to the woman, Serpent, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So Eve is now drawn to the conversation. She wants to explain what God had told them. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you what? Question and answer. Did Eve at this point have the fear of God in her heart? You know, people don't like that fear of God. And yet the book of Revelation chapter 14, it was pointed out very wonderful last night says that the everlasting gospel, says this mighty angel has the everlasting gospel to preach unto how much of the world? All the world. And the next part says, fear God. The word fear there does not simply mean respect. I've heard so many preachers with this. I've heard people play all kinds of games with this. It was a reverence element there, but it's not just merely reverence. It means terror. It means fear. Now immediately people, I'm going to hear people say, well, you don't, you don't mean that God's going to scare us into heaven. Listen, you'll get to heaven because you love God, but he may have used some fear to help motivate you at some point. And don't tell me that's bad. I had, uh, of course, two kids, and I loved them both. And my little boy, um, he he had to sometimes stick his finger in the light plug just to see if there's really electricity in it. You know what I mean? I'm using that proverbially. (laughs) You know, this this didn't really happen, but it could have happened. If you tell your boy, son... Do not play in the road. Why are you doing it? If you play in the road, you're going to get in trouble with debt. You know, my mother, mother had two boys, and we were two boys. She had hands full. And, and I had a marvelous mother. She was smart. And most of the time, what she did worked. But when something didn't work, she had a fallback position that did work. And that fallback position was this. Boys, you don't straighten up. I'm going to tell your dad. (laughs) My dad didn't didn't, uh, discipline us very often. But when he did, you didn't forget it. Let's put it that way. By the way, the Bible says the discipline doesn't hurt you and that we're glad for it when we're grown. And I'm glad for my father's discipline. It didn't feel too good when it happened, but today I'm glad for it. Because there's something about discipline that helps get us in line. So if you say to your boy, or maybe your daughter, I don't care, do not play in the road. Why are you doing that? Suppose you come out and you find your boy playing in the middle of the road and there's a Mack truck coming down the road. So you're going to sit there and say, you know, really, son, I I don't want to hurt your feelings now. Bless your sweet little heart. Um, Can we have a little conversation about this? You know, I don't want to mess you up psychologically. No, come on. What are you going to do? 
you're going to use all the power of your voice and you're going to say, get out of the road! Why? Why are you trying to scare the daylights out of me? Because there's a Mack truck. God is honest. God tells the truth. There are consequences to sin. The wages of sin is death. And God is love. And he does not want you or me to be paid the wages of sin. That's why there's those startling warnings in Scripture about what happens to the wicked in the end of time. God's not just trying to, he's not trying to scare us from that standpoint. He's just trying to tell us the truth. Just because you shout at your boy to get out of the road because of a Mack truck, do you shout because you hate him? Because you're trying to hurt him? You shout because you love him. Am I right? Now, I know what it says in 1 John chapter 5, that perfect love casts out fear. Look at the context. Perfect love casts out fear in the day of judgment. Hallelujah. I don't plan to have any fear in the day of judgment because I plan by the grace of God to be covered by the grace of God. But the fear of God still has a place to play in our life. The book of of, uh, Proverbs says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It says in another place, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And Job says, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And the Apostle Paul says in chapter 3, after he lists a whole list of people's sins, describing them as being so selfish that their throat is like an open grave, he ends it saying, because there is no fear of God in their hearts or lives. They They have no fear of God. I struggle that because it's still hard for people to get it straightened out. And I, and I struggle. I said, Lord, I need, to help, I need to understand exactly how to help people understand the fear of God. And I think I found it as I studied here with Eve. So what does the serpent do? Watch what happens here. Watch what happens Verse 4, the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely what? He's undoing the fear of God. And here's the fear of God said in another way, in a more common vernacular. The fear of God is to take God serious. Does that make sense? If God says, you eat of that tree, you will die, then you should take God serious. Parents, Do you want to be taken serious when you tell your child something uh, that's important and of consequences and that have consequences? I don't know of a parent anywhere that says, no, I don't want my kid to be taken serious. So what you really want is you want your child to have the fear of the parent because of consequences. Does that mean you don't love your child? No, you would love your child. Of course, you can abuse anything. God is not abusing it. Eve got it. She understood it. She understood that God was serious. And she believed God. And she took God serious. And the Bible calls that the fear of God. The devil's point is to undo the fear of God. And so he immediately contradicts that and says, you you will not surely die. And then he undermines the trust because he's also wanting to switch that citadel, to switch that citadel from loyalty to God to himself. And so he says to her in verse 5, for God knows, he lies, he mixes truth with error. For God knows in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. He is a slander. He slanders God, knowing good and evil. There's some truth to that. But what he didn't do is he didn't show what the consequences really would be. In fact, he denied the consequences. 
Now notice how Eve buys in verse 6. Notice the three things. Here's the logic of sin that is illogical. I know that sounds like a contradiction. But when the devil comes and he tempts you to do something, he wants to make it really logical. So you can just, you, you can just give a reason, a good excuse as to why you ought to be able to do this. Here it comes. So when the woman saw that the tree was what? Good for food. That it was pleasant to the eyes. And a tree desirable to make one wise. Wise in what? Evil. And to make one wise. She did what? You take away the fear of God. You take away a person's taking God serious. And the next thing you get is sin. You don't take God serious. You will sin. Not if and in but. You will. Any of us will. We must take God serious. Back to Matthew. Back to Matthew chapter 4. Verse 3. The tempter came to him, If you are the Son of God. In other words, doubt the voice, doubt the dove, doubt the testimony of John. He appears like he's, Jesus is starving to death, as it were. He appears like a great messenger from heaven probably coming in saying something to the effect I don't know we don't have all the record but you know I'm here to help you <laughs> uh, you're obviously in need of help uh, you know the devil he, he appears to like he's a great benefactor doesn't he I'm here to help you <laughs> you know if, if you're the son of God it obviously you know you must be but why don't you just use that power of yours and make yourself? And you know, he didn't even say make himself a banquet. He just said just the very necessities of life. Jesus' answer is very, very powerful. Verse 4. And he answered and said, it is Written. Jesus said, I am in a citadel of the trust of my heavenly Father. I am not moving outside of the will of God as revealed in Scripture. It is the only safety for God's people in the end of time. The only way we get through this end of time lion's den is our trust in the written word of God. Either we trust it or we die. It is written, man, Jesus in essence counters the devil. He says, I'm not here as the son of God. I'm here as a man. I'm here to live as men must live. I am here to suffer as they must suffer. I'm here to go through what they must go through. I am here to die for them. I have come as a man and I cannot fulfill this ministry. I cannot fulfill being their substitute. I cannot save them and use my divine powers outside of the will of God. To do that would destroy my ability to win man and to save them. The devil would say, but you're hungry. I mean, your Heavenly Father, He's nice, isn't He? He likes you. He wants to help you. Go ahead and make a loaf or two of bread. It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone. Flash back to Israel who was in a wilderness. Israel, 
who had been delivered from Egypt and was in the Sinai across the Red Sea and probably in Saudi Arabia, coming up toward Mount Sinai, and they were running out of food. And Deuteronomy, Moses said, God tested you in the wilderness. What did they do when they started running out of food? They started coming up with their own human solutions. Well, God, I mean, we, could, we ate better in Egypt. They forgot about the taskmasters that were beating them half to death. They forgot about the misery and no hope for their children. They forgot about all that. All they could think of was the flesh pots of Egypt. We ate there and we were full. God said to Moses, I'll send them manna. And then Moses draws the lesson in Deuteronomy chapter 8. He says, because God wanted you to understand that man shall not live by bread alone. Jesus quotes that. My dear friends, it's not merely the physical needs that we have. We are not mere fed animals. We are spiritual. We have a relationship with God. We can commune with him and our life depends not merely on physical bread, but on communion with God. Men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Amen. But our world today thinks that they must live by bread alone. Our world is fascinated today, intensely so, with the physical needs, the lower nature. There's nothing wrong with your lower nature. There's nothing wrong with relationships between men and women as long as that is in the context of the will of God and the written word. There's nothing wrong with good food as long as we do it within the written perimeters. By the way, people through Christianity, they thought they could conquer this basic nature by going into monkery and whipping and all that thing. But let me tell you this. You can only overcome the sinful indulgences that we are all subject to and the abuse of those indulgences by one thing, the power of the living Christ and depending on what he depended on, it is written. The power of Jesus is your power. And he's powerful. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. 